So last time um, we have seen two things. So the first thing was amortized analysis. with the potential method. And the other thing was this first order language. Language, functional language with lists and an um, affine type system. So, and what we want to do today is combine uh, these two things and have like the amortized analysis inside a type system. So, yeah, we are interested in um, automi uh, automizing the um, 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 uh, amortized analysis. And to do that, we kind of like gonna fix a format of these potential functions. So we cannot expect, you know, any automatic method to come up with arbitrary potential functions. So we're gonna restrict ourselves to a particular form. And um, the easiest or simplest form uh, that I'm, I'm aware of is uh, linear functions. So we're gonna have functions um, that are linear in the sizes of the input data. And since we have a, a static type system, we can kind of like take the types as a hint on what the shapes of the potential should look like. So functions are different for like, let's say a pair of lists than they, they are like for Boolean, okay? So what I'm gonna define um, is what I call resource annotated data types. So definition. Data types. Um, and um, they are basically the data types that, that you've seen before, but now we have on the list types a rational number. Q. Um, then we have the pairs, and we have the booleans. Okay, so they basically look like before, but now they have this non negative. rational number Q on all the list types. And this number Q is gonna like define a potential that is linear in the size of the list here. Okay, so um, I'll do a lot of examples soon, um, but let me first um, define what the uh, potential is. And to this end, we uh, gonna define what um, uh, the values of our language are first, so definition uh, values. So the values of type bool are true and false. <coughs> values of a pair type uh, simply the Cartesian product of the values of A, A1 and the values of A2. Okay, and for a list, Type A, so we kind of like ignore this 
annotation Q, and we just have the set of lists so that the AIs are values of type A. Okay, and now we can define the potential of a value um, under type. So um, well, this is defined for um, for values A of type A. Okay, inductively, and we say so the value of true that the potential of true of type bool is the same as the potential of false of type bool, which is zero. And the <coughs> potential of a pair, A1, A2 of type A1 star A2 is simply the sum potential of A1 under type A1 plus the potential of A2 under type A2. Okay, and the interesting part is the lists. So if you have a list with N elements of type L, Q, of A, then uh, the potential is Q times N plus the sum of the potentials of all the elements under type A. Okay, so that means that like if you have a list of lists, yeah, of course here you might have more queues inside, okay, and this potential then contributes to this phi here. So let's take a look at a few examples. So uh, let's say we have a, a list of Booleans, yeah, true, true, false, and we say this list has a potential for then what is the potential? Twelve, Twelve exactly. So Four times three, twelve. Okay. So that's it. And so we, yeah, we have this type system now, and um, we're going to define a type system that will kind of like use this potential to pay for the cost yeah, as, as we go along. And um, before I introduce that, um, Formally, I want to give you a little bit of a, a intuition how that goes by um, looking at an example first. So um, let's first say what the function types are.
So the function types have a, an annotated type for the arguments and then have this annotation q, q prime here and then have an annotated type for the result. And this q and q prime here, that's also part of the potential. So the q is the input potential and the q prime is the output potential. So this is kind of like the constant part of the potential. So you have kind of like a, a linear part that is given by the A1 and then you have a constant part that is given by the Q and then you also have output potential. Yeah, and this output potential is given by this Q prime, this is the constant part of the output potential and uh, the linear part is given by this A2. And this potential you have then after using a function you can feed it into the next function to pay for the cost of uh, uh, the, the rest of the program. And this is what gives you a compositionality uh, that is very important. So uh, let's look at a, a concrete example. So. so in all these examples, um, yeah, we have to define uh, what the cost is, but we haven't seen the cost semantics yet, so um, we're going to do that informally, and we have kind of like a cost metric where we pay for the number of cons operations in the uh, programs. So, yeah, let's look at um, a pen first. think about what I want to do with this later. Um, okay. So yeah, we just implement a pen like you would do it. So if x is empty, then it's just y's. And if we have a head and a <laughs> tail, um, then yeah, we use our uh, shell at normal form. So uh, we have to introduce a temporary variable here. Then we append the axis prime to the y's and then cons the x to the result. Okay, so um, how many cons operations are executed by this function in the worst case? Yes, length of axis, number uh, cons operations. Okay, so yeah, let me write it like that, one times axis. Or let's say number of cons operations in uh, append Axis wise. Exactly. So, how can we express this in our type system? So, So what I have to do now is I have to add these rational numbers to the list, okay? So to express exactly this bound, what I can do is I can add just one here, zero here, zero constant ones, and then after I call the function, all these potential units that are attached to the first list here will get used up yeah, to, to pay for the cost, and then I have nothing left and nothing left to attach to uh, the output list here. Okay, so yeah, the um, input potential here is exactly, if you look at the uh, <coughs> definition, okay, uh, exactly represents this bound here we, we want to show. Okay, because we have, uh, 
Uh, where can I put it? Can I put it over here? Yeah, because we have the potential of x's and y's <coughs> under this type. is 1 times x's plus 0 times y's. And that's exactly the bound that, that is reflected by this. Yeah. So if you remember like this theorem we had um, was kind of like the initial potential um, plus the amortized cost is an, is an upper bound. And here it's a bit different. Here we're going to set it up in the way that the amortized cost is always zero, so the initial potential is always an upper bound. So, and this is what's, what's reflected here in, in this type. So this is not the only type um, we can use for, for um, a pen. So um, assume we have a, a program um, f of, or function f of x, y, z. Um, where we say like, okay, first um, we append x and y, and then we append the result to z. So how many cons operations do we execute now? Yes, two times x or two times length of x plus y. Yeah, wh why is that? So first, um, we call this append function here. Yeah, so we figured already out. Okay, this is length of x's or length of x. In this case, the, the number of cons operations, and then. Um, we have a list t here, and t is the length of t is the length of x plus the length of y, and then we feed it here uh, into a pend. So, and that means we have another uh, um, length of x plus length of y uh, 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 cons operations inside the second append. So, and this is the number of, of cons operations. Yeah. Uh, here? Yeah, because we um, don't have any um, constant cost here. So um, if you would have something like, let's say, you know, um, uh, you, would, you would add like a, a, a cons operation here, yeah, where you um, append one more uh, Boolean here, a uh, true, I want to say. Okay, so in this case, you would have one here instead of zero, because you have to have like you have to pay for this one extra cons, and then you have one and zero. Yeah. But just in this case, um, it, it happens to be uh, that yeah, there there's no uh, constant factor here in the bound, so you don't need anything. So it's it's a good question. So if we <laughs> just had the the original function, where's my um, without this additional cons here. So um, what you can, of course, also have is um, an uh, alternative type where you, know, you just have a little bit too much potential. So this is also sound. So if you have two here and you know, zero here and two here and maybe one here and zero here. So that's another type that's perfectly sound. Yeah, it's not a, a good bound that you get, kind of, but you can also have this type. Yeah, so you have enough potential to pay for the cost, yeah, and you have a little bit of waste. Yeah, so this is also a, a correct typing. Yes? And so will this one come from the cost of x, so the cons? Like, why do you think the cons just cost one? 
Oh yeah, exactly. That's just like an, an um, arbitrary choice for now. So yeah, yeah. You, you will later see how, how that goes. So you can, yeah, we'll have a, a cost metric and then it can so be. So the match is not adding a <coughs> or is like part of that one? Um, Oh no, right now it's just like an assumption. Let's say you're, you're a user and you're just interested in the number of cons operations. Okay. So that's not a like very reasonable choice. It's just like to illustrate okay. how this works, yeah. And later on, yeah, you, it works for like any cost metric that you give me, so to speak. Okay, so let's come back to our function f here. So here we have this first call to append and um, for this first call of append here, um, we need a little bit of a stronger type um, because um, we need to assign potential to t here, okay? Because t will end up being the argument of this append here, so we need the potential annotation 1 for the t, okay? That means for um, our append here, we need to get potential 1 here, okay? So let's maybe use red for this. So let's look at, at this call of append here. So here we want to have like the um, output potential one, okay? And to get that, um, we have to have potential two here, I claim, potential one here, and again, zero, zero. Yeah, why, 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 why we have the one here? Yeah, because we have here the second call uh, to append, okay? And this, we know already how to type. We type it here with a black type where we need potential one for this first list here, okay? But this potential one needs to come from some, so, from some you know, other potential, namely from the inputs somehow to get a global bound in the end. So we have to figure out how we can get potential one on the t here, okay? And then we have to, to look, okay, where does the t come from? It comes from a call to append, okay? So this needs to have list type, you know, L1 of bool. So that's what we need as an output here of append. So from append, we need to get a list where we have potential one assigned to each element, okay? And to pay for that, we have to have enough potential on the arguments, okay? So here we need potential one for every element in the second list, okay? And this potential just gets transferred to the output. And here on the first list, we need two. We need one for each element to pay for the cost of a, of a pend, and then we have one per element left after paying for the cost, and that's also what we take to um, assign here to the output list. Yes? Yes. And so now it's no longer sufficient to have a pen output, a list with one potential, you need to have an output with two potential. Oh, sure. If you, you need to have, say, three, and then how does this not just keep Yes, it? yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, so I mean, wh where does it stop? And so, yeah, it never stops. Um, so you have to have, you can't just, um, in this type system, as you will see it today, you can't just give one type to a pen. So it needs different types depending on what you do with the data later in the program. Okay? <coughs> So that's just a, a effect of, of life here. But it's like in every program, you only have a you know, finite number of appends showing up, so there's always like, um, um, you can always find a, a, set, a finite set of, of types to, to type the program. And you, then we will see um, next lecture on Monday um, that there's also like, yeah, you can also like give a nice summary and have kind of like a principal type for, for, for this as well, where you have like linear constraints on these annotations, but we're not going to get into that. So for today, just assume you know you have a possibly infinite set of these types, and depending on the situation, you have to pick the right one. Um, and the, the implementation of this in resource aware ML, this is all going to be automatic. So you just write the program, press a button, and then it works. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, okay. yeah, exactly. So 
Yeah, so what you also see now is um, basically you can see from the um, type we used for, for a pen here what the type of f should be. So that's also something I want to write down. Um, maybe, maybe I squeeze it in here. So um, f um, has a type three lists. and gives us a list. Okay, and basically we can just read off like uh, the, the potential we need now. Well, we need for, for the x, we need potential two, as it is given here by a pen. For the y, we need potential one. And for the uh, z here, we need potential zero, as given here by the uh, black type. So. Yeah, we have for the x, 2, for the y, 1, for the z, 0, and here, again, 0, constant potential. And what we get in the end is also clear. That's given by um, this black type of a pen here. Okay? So, yeah, and you see um, this type again exactly <coughs> reflects the bound, uh, the tight bound here on the number of cons operations. Yeah, so you can already see that this, um, these potential types help you um, to, yeah, to reason um, about the cost of a, a program in a compositional way. Yeah? So to, I mean, when we are like thinking about, okay, what is the, the total cost of this function f? Yeah, we were thinking, okay, what is the size of t? And you know, how do we relate that to, to, to the arguments? And here with this potential reasoning that all kind of like happens magically and you don't even have in this type system to talk about the size of things. That all like happens automatically and that's why it's so easy to automate. Okay, good. So, yeah, what do I want to do now? Let's maybe, um, yeah. How do you? How do lists get potential in the first place? Do they have some potential when they're, they're created? Or? Yes, basically at the beginning of the program, you, you know, <coughs> the, the, the um, argument types say okay, basically, okay, you create this potential out of nowhere at the beginning and then you use it to pay for things. So with the types, so <coughs> list of booths have a certain potential and list of booths have another certain potential? Or um, no, it's, a, it's the same thing, basically. I mean, uh, um, you can have, I mean, you see that here already, you can have um, bool lists in your program that have different potential, right? I mean, one has potential two, the other one has potential zero. Um, and the same is true for, for ints as well. You only have for one fixed list, you have like one, the same potential per element. How do you, how do you get to the potential? That's, yeah. For, for now, we say like, okay, we have to come up with it, but um, yeah, there's like an, an automatic inference algorithm that we're gonna see um, yeah, uh, next time. So we're not gonna talk about that today. For now, we just say like, okay, you know, we came up with this type and the type rules help us to, to justify it. Okay, good, so that's the basic idea. So I was wondering if I should, since I have the, um, a pen here, maybe we might as well um, take a look how, yeah, I'll, yeah. Let me just take a step back and um, we talk about the cost semantic first and um, then we come back to this type system and um, we're gonna see how, how it works. But it's maybe better to do the cost semantics first because then we can actually say you know, what these types means and what, what it means for such a type to be sound. Okay, good, so yeah, we let this sit for a moment. Um, and talk about the cost semantics.
And that also helps us to come back to this issue of uh, why do we just pay for the cons operations. So um, we're going to have evaluation judgments of the following form. So we have an environment, and then we have a, a cost metric M here, and then we have two annotations Q and Q prime here, and the value. So what are all these things? So um, here we have an environment that maps variables to values. We have a metric, so this is an, an environment. So this is a metric. So the metric maps set of constants to rational numbers. And so basically you have a constant for every um, syntactic form in the language, and the user can define with this metric what the cost should be for each construct. And the whole semantics, and also like the type system is parametric in this metric, uh, you can define it. So, and the cost of an operation can also be negative, and that means you get resources back. So for instance, when you, you know, free memory, um, or like uh, when you know, function call comes back and you, you get the stack frame back. So then you would have like this negative cost there. Um, so here Q and Q prime are um, again non-negative rational numbers and V uh, is a value. Okay, and this, uh, we know already what that is. Um, this is up here. Okay, so um, you might wonder um, why we have uh, two numbers here in our, our cost semantics and what does it mean? So the idea is here, so um, this is something I call resource safety. So the idea is basically that you start your program with some resources you can use, okay? You can think of it, for instance, when you think about memory, you can think of it as being the size of a free list, okay? And then you execute your program, and then you have some resources left over, and this is the Q prime. What can happen now, of course, is that you run out of resources, and then you're stuck. So then you don't get this, this judgment. So you have to kind of like start your program with a sufficient amount of resources, only then you get this evaluation judgment. Otherwise, you know, it's stuck like in a, in a regular big step evaluation judgment where you, for instance, you know, can't reason about termination and you also, you then you, you, you're stuck and you don't get a judgment. So it's the same here um, when you run out of resources. So um, to understand why we have to do it that way, I mean, you, 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 you might say like, okay, why can't we just have one number and this one number is kind of like the watermark, the high watermark of uh, the resource usage. Um, yeah, bec because that's what we're interested in here. So if you have something, you know, that be can become available again, like memory, then you always want to have like the, the high watermark instead of the net cost. But if you just do that with um, one number, so let's look at an example here. So um, which one do I have here? So yeah, so let's use like the notation from uh, resource aware ML um, um, where we have these tick operations. Yeah, and tick just means you have a, a, a cost here. So let's say in E1 uh, we have cost 10 and then um, we have, you know, cost minus 10, which means, okay, we get 10 resource user units back right away. So what is the um, high water mark uh, of this? Yeah, exactly. So the high water mark is 10. 
but the net cost is kind of zero because you know at the end you have your 10 back and so in, in our semantics basically um, we can write you know um, something like 10 10 here uh, okay so um, let's now look at the e2 where you just have tick 10. So here the high water mark is um, also 10, um, but uh, we don't get the resources back, so uh, we can't write something like this. So um, instead what we have to write is something like this. So E2 um, started with 10 and then has 0. Okay, so if we would try to um, just model that with, with one number that tracks the high water mark, okay, if this one here would be gone, okay, then uh, we can't distinguish the two anymore. And that's, of course, a problem if you now have like um, a, a larger expression where we say like, okay, let where we have first the E1 and then tick 20. And then we have the E2, tick 20. So now um, if you kind of like want to write down the semantics, right, for, for the let, then you would say like, okay, first um, I take a look at the high watermark for the E1, okay, which is 10, okay, and then I look at the high watermark for this tick 20 here, which, which is 20, and then I come up with a high watermark for the, for the whole thing somehow, but it doesn't work like that because the high watermark for the E2 is also 10. Yeah, tick 20, high watermark is also 20, and from this information, you, you, you can't distinguish the two because um, the high watermark for uh, this one here is 20, and the high watermark for this one here is 30. Okay, because here you get the resources back, so um, yeah, the uh, 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 yeah, so so it's just twenty here. Yeah. What does the lower number mean again? Uh, that means that, like the resources that are available after oh. the evaluation. Yeah. Okay, so if you um, if you're just interested in time, then it's okay. You can just use one number. <laughs> And um, if you're interested in, in other resources like memory, then you have to have two numbers. You don't have to set it up like this um, with this like resource safety where you, you know, start with something and you, 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 you have a, a leftover and you can run out of resources. You can also have like a more descriptive thing where you just run it and you get the high water mark and the leftover. Um, but the thing is kind of like, more, uh, or it's, it's deterministic, you just have one pair of such numbers. And here what you can do, um, of course, you can always like start with a little bit more resources and then uh, you end up with, with more resources later. Um, but it's kind of like the simplest way to do it, so that's why, why, why we do it like this. Okay, good, so um, <coughs> let's look at a few of the uh, evaluation rules. Mm. Maybe start over there. That's my. There's a question. Yeah. Can you find and trigger this? Uh, yes. So if you you know just have a program where um, you have like a negative tick, so then there you go. So you start with zero and then you have twenty or whatever. Yeah. So you could Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so then like, yeah, so then you would have kind of like a negative net cost. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yes, so they're always positive or non-negative, so they can be zero. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, okay, so um, let's start with the um, variable rule. So uh, we have our environment and our resource <coughs> metric and um, a variable x. And we have the, the q, q prime here. <coughs> and um, we evaluate to just the value of this variable in the um, environment. And what we need to have is that the q um, equals to the Q prime plus the cost of um, the lookup of the variable, which is given by our metric M. So this is just M bar. Yeah, so I use this notation instead of M of bar. Um, yeah, we can also, can also uh, write it like that. Yeah, and var is one of our, our constants um, that define the resource usage. Okay, and the um, other rules are very similar. So uh, let's, for instance, do the function application. So um, you have the environment again. And yeah, I've, here I assume that we have a, a fixed global program yeah, with a signature given already um, that um, doesn't change, so this is all not part of this judgment, but we always assume that we have these, you know, um, um, pairs of functions and bodies given, as you have seen last time. So that's what will happen here in the um, application. So if we apply f to argument x, and we have the q, q prime here, and we get a value v prime. So um, what we... Uh, do is we look up the x in the environment and then we create a new environment using uh, the argument of the function in the function definition and evaluate the function body which is given in this global list yeah, ef and, and we have some cost uh, for this of course so uh, let's say that's p and Q prime in the end. And so what we need to have here for the Q is a little bit more, um, namely Q is the cost of the application plus um, the resources I start with here for the evaluation of the function body. And this is of course V prime. Okay, so one more. Let's do the let maybe. Okay, for the let, so we also start with environment V, and then we have our let E1 equals X and E2, and we evaluate it with resources at the start Q and resources Q prime at the end. So uh, what we have to do is first we have to pay for the cost of the let, so um, we get Q0 plus M let, and then we take this Q0 to pay for the uh, cost of the E1. And we get Q1, and then we take the V1 and bind it to X. And we evaluate the E2 starting with Q1 and we get Q prime and V. Uh, 
Um, it's just you, you kind of like subtract the mlet from the q. Yeah. So what kind of course happen is, so um, always in these rules here, we have the implicit side condition that all these q's are non-negative, okay? So um, if you end up here, or if you start this with a um, q that let's say, you know, is zero, um, and uh, the cost for the lead is, is positive, okay, then um, you, you can't use this rule. Yeah, you're not allowed to use it because um, <coughs> then you would end up with a Q0 that's negative. Yeah, that does not work. So there you, you can get stuck, for instance, when you don't have enough resources at the beginning. So, um, yeah, what else can we look at? So, um, Yeah, is there any any rule that you would like to see? Maybe um, the sharing we can do because it's non-standard that I, by the way, don't have here, but I can make it up. So, um, <coughs> so share x x1, x2, and e. <coughs> so first um, we look up x and then um, we add to our environment, well, um, we kind of like remove x. Hmm. Yeah, let's say we prime <coughs> minus x. So that's not such a nice notation. Yeah, I just mean I remove x from the environment, and then I add x1, and I add x2. They have the same value as x in the original one. And then uh -oh, I run out of space. So then I um, evaluate e with Q prime, and I get V, and P is, well, let's write the other way around, Q um, is P plus the cost of the share. Yeah, so now you also know what the, what the sharing means. Okay, yeah, is there, yeah? I was wondering, if I think there's still like that cost of copying, is that a wrong intuition? Yeah, that's a wrong intuition because um, if you, um, I mean, you have, you can have a, a constant cost, of course, for, for, for the sharing. So that's what, what you can have. But let's say, yeah, so let's say this A is, is a list. So what would um, happen in a real implementation of a functional language is aliasing. Right, so you would just have like a heap and an, an environment, and so you would just have like a constant cost. You would just like extend your environment with like one more variable and like a pointer to this heap so data structure. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, we th think of it like you know, it's it's really implement. Usually, I also have a, a semantics <coughs> where I have a, a heap and a stack really. Um, and then like it's it's more clear that you won't have any any costs here, but um, it makes yeah it makes a few things more complicated. That's why for yeah when I when I taught this course at CMU last semester I had like a heap and a, and a stack and then it's more clear. But here yeah we we yeah just think of it as as like uh, being an abstraction of that that's you know 
um, um, the, so the cost is accurate, but like yeah, if you um, 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 would actually do a copy of a list here, then um, of course, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so are there, yeah, so I don't want to spend too much time with that. So uh, are there any particular rules you, you want to see or you think it's, it's about clear how, how that works? Okay, good. <coughs> Okay, so I want to mention, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. So um, the, well, the the point you you don't need it really. It's just like a, a technicality that it makes it easier to write down the rules. So um, the sharing, you could kind of like take care of it um, also like in a, in, in a non-affine type system, um, but it's kind of like yeah, just a little bit harder to write down the rules. So in, in the end, this like whole affine type system is not like a, a restriction to you know, any usage. It just helps us a bit like writing down the rules. And I mean, you um, also, I mean, you might want to like define it differently and you know, you could, uh, nothing would prevent you to say, okay, sharing has a linear cost um, in, in, in the size of the data if you wanted that. So that would be also possible to do with this type system, right? So then you would have like a, a more complex cost expression here, but so that would be entirely possible if you want to like, you know, implement your language like that, you can do it that way well, so you have the flexibility. Good, but that's not what, what um, we do. Okay, so three lemmas. Um, so lemma one. Um, so we have, and yeah, this is, um, Totally undefined now, I write it anyways. So um, this is just like a normal big step evaluation judgment without the cost, right? So you, you get that basically from these rules by deleting all the cues and the um, equalities. Um, so we have this um, if and only if um, there um, exists Q U prime. Um, so that E um, evaluates uh, to V uh, with starting resources Q and uh, resources Q prime left over. Okay, so every um, terminating computation you can annotate with some cost. Uh, you can prove that. So. <coughs> Another lemma is, so if you have two um, evaluations, so and you start them with different um, or possibly different uh, resource counters, so uh, you start one with Q and you have Q prime, and um, you have another one in the same environment V, same metric M, same expression E, but now you start with P and you end up with P prime. So um, what is the relation of the P's and the Q's? What do you think? So what we have is the difference um, between Q and Q prime as a difference of the P and P prime, yeah? So basically, if you start with a little bit more, let's say, you know, uh, a constant um, um, K more, 
then you also get this constant k back at the end. I mean, makes sense if you look at the rules. Yeah, this is, for instance, certainly true for the for the variable rule here. Okay, and um, another thing that's true. Let's see if I can squeeze it in here. So, um, if you have such a judgment and any metric M, Q prime, evaluate to V, then um, you can always add such a constant. Oops. Now let's say C. for every C that is not negative. So um, what you see here already is that there is um, kind of like a minimal Q um, that you need to have to kind of like, you know, start um, 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 or the, 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 that you need at the start of your computation so that you don't get stuck, okay? And I mentioned already earlier, you can also set it up that you have um, an evaluation judgment that is not non-deterministic like this or like uh, where, where, where you can have uh, multiples of these like P, P primes here, but just like this minimal one. So that's also possible. Um, and it's actually quite nice, so uh, with this, technique where you have kind of like a call it resource effect. Um, there you can also talk about partial evaluations in a big step semantics where you basically say like, okay, you have an evaluation tree and then you stop at the uh, middle, you don't get a value back, but what you get is a, a high watermark resource usage up to this point. And that helps you to also talk about non-terminating computations. And this is something we use to prove later that bounds on the number of evaluation steps also prove termination. But uh, we, we yeah, so this is something you can see in the like um, resources um, um, page. And there are some links where, where you can read about that, but we're not gonna have that in the, in the course here because we don't have enough time. Good, so that's that. Let's come back to our um, type system. So one thing we need, one last definition, is we also need to assign a potential to an environment. Yeah, because for the yeah, type judgments, yeah, we're gonna have context, and so we wanna not just have the um, potential annotations in the types, but also in the context, of course. And then you want to say, like, okay, what is the potential of an environment under a given context? So, yeah, last definition. Well, maybe not the last for today, but almost. Um, so, let uh, V be an environment. And let gamma be a context. Gamma mm, be an annotated context. So that just means it's a typing context that has like these annotated types here yeah, with the cues on the list. So um, the potential of the environment V under context gamma is the phi V of gamma 
and that is simply the sum um, over all the variables in gamma and then it's just the potential of the values under the types. They're also, I think I got it wrong here, so it's the potential of gamma <coughs> under environment V. So that's what I want to say. Yeah, so here uh, I made a mistake and I flipped those. Okay, good. Um, so another thing we have is um, a resource annotated signature. So this is simply like a function signature like you have seen it before. Um, but this time we're going to have a set of types yeah, as discussed earlier, um, we need different types for the append, let's say. So we just don't want to commit to one type of the append, but just to a set of types. So um, uh, resource annotated function signature. is a mapping um, sigma from the um, function identifiers to um, uh, the set of first order types. Mm. So yeah, I write it like this, f lin without the empty set. So these are like the linear annotated <coughs> function types. Okay, so this is simply as before, but now we not just have one function type, but like a, a set of function types, but we have at least one. Okay, this is something we, we require. Okay, good, so now we have all the ingredients and we can in the last 20 minutes um, talk about the actual type system. So before we do that, we, um, come back to our pant here. So there, yeah, we remember we had these different types and let's see, uh, let's say we wanna justify uh, this red type here, okay? So before we look at the rules of the type system, we see how this is gonna work for uh, uh, this particular example append here. Okay, and we, um, we are justifying the red type. So what we do is we start with a resource annotated context here that is given um, by the function type. Okay, so um, we have the, well maybe, Let's write the whole thing in red. So we have the axis. Yeah, let me just uh, write it like that because I don't have so much space, so I leave out the bool. Um, and we have the y's, which have the annotation one in the context. And then we also have a, a constant potential around zero. Okay, and this is what we're gonna have to use now to 
pay for the cost. And um, again, we're going to pay for the number of cons operations here. So yeah, we assume like a metric M where this like M cons is one and the other M, uh, M, uh, M, uh, M of uh, constants are zero. So, okay, the first thing um, we have to do is we have to say like, okay, if we take this nil branch here, okay, um, how is this potential sufficient to um, assign potential one to this output list here and potential zero, okay? Um, this is what we get from here, okay? And we have to justify this um, with the input potential. So, but here we have potential one for the y's, okay? And we can just take this potential and attach it to, to this one, okay? And for the axis, I mean, we have two potential units for every element in the axis, okay? But here we know that um, um, the, the list has length zero, so we don't have any potential at all. So here we simply forget about the axis um, because they kind of like get consumed here by, by the, the match and, and they are gone and we don't even waste potential. So here we basically have um, only the y's, yeah, and uh, we can, and uh, constant potential zero, um, yeah, which we also get from here, and we can simply use that to justify this type here. So it's more interesting in the lead case. So in the lead case, what will happen is, um, in, in the, sorry, in the cons case of the match, um, where we have this lead here. So here, um, what will happen is, let me maybe move this a little bit to the left here. So what will ha happen here is we have a new context where we have the x, uh, which is a bool, and we have the x is prime, which is a list type, and we have the y's, which is also a list type, and constant potential. Okay, and the question is what should we put here? So, and this is a, a very important point of this type system. So, what happens if the sizes of data structures change? And there we kind of like have the, the transfer of potential from lists to the constant potential, okay? So here, the y's, it's, it's easy, they don't change, so we still have one potential unit per element in the y's, okay? But what changes is the um, uh, axis. So that gets split up in a tail, and here for the tail, we're simply gonna say like, okay, we also have the uh, potential two here, okay? But then we have two potential units left, namely the ones that were attached to the head of the list, to the X. And this gets added to the constant potential zero. So we have constant potential two here. Okay, so we had potential two times axis, and now we have two times length of axis prime plus two. Yeah, so we get the spill that we can now use to pay for the cost uh, that happens kind of like in between two recursive calls. Yeah, so what will happen now here is that we have exactly what we need um, for our type of append that we want to justify. So we have two potential units for the first argument, one potential unit for the second argument here, exactly as we need in, in our red type here, okay? So what we get out is um, a potential one for, for this T, okay? So, and what we also get out is a potential two. Um, here it says zero, zero, and we don't quite have that. We have a little bit more, but we will have a type rule where we say like, okay, you know, if you have more constant potential, namely here two, then you can just pass it on. And that's what we do here. So we have two and we just pass it on 
not use it for the append and have it available here again. Okay, and here we are now in a situation where we have still x is a Boolean um, and we have t is a list with annotation one and we have this potential two uh, around. Okay, so what we do now is um, with this two, one we use to pay for the cost of the cons. Okay, and uh, then we have one left and this other one we need to pay for the potential that we attach to the x in this new list. Okay, so um, here we have um, potential one again, which is um, okay for the, for the tail. We don't have to do anything, but we have to pay one for this x. Okay, and that's why we have potential zero, but that's a perfect fit for our type of append that we were trying to justify. Okay, so this is how the type system will work informally. Good. Questions so far? Yes. Yes, so that's what we're going to see in the last lecture. So you can extend it to um, polynomial. So we're going to see in the last lecture uh, that this works for univariate polynomials where you have kind of like, you know, um, a quadratic thing that's like attached to one list, but it even works for things like, you know, n squared times m and things like that. Yeah, but we're, we're not going to see this, but that's also like in the material that's um, on the web. No, no, it does, doesn't work for, for logarithmic costs right now. So the, the problem with the advantage that you have with polynomial is that you have nice compositionality. So the, if, if you have a function that has like, you know, that's polynomial, you know the size of the output is bound by a polynomial, you can feed it into another function. It's all going to stay polynomial. And with a logarithm in there, you don't have that anymore. Yeah. And that is a, a challenge, yeah. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. Um, no, that's not really. So, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, if if you don't have to pay for anything, then um, so th we do that. No, you don't have to. If if you say it depends on what you want in the end. So here we looked at a more complicated type where we want to have potential one for the output list. Okay, but if you if you if you add a, put a zero there, then you don't have to pay for anything. So if you, if you have a metric where all your m's are zero and um, you say like, okay, at the end of the day, you know, my, my output type has only zeros attached to it too, then you can always do the zero, zero, zero th thing. And then okay. you don't have so to. One, one, one zero, one, you might not be okay. Because I'm creating, I'm creating too much of a structure and I need to pay. Yes, it. yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. You have, to, uh, you have to pay for the potential, I mean, like, We've seen before, like for, for the binary counter, right? You always have to, to, to pay for the potential at the next state. So it's the same thing here. Yeah. So if you want to find the, the smallest Q such that the evaluation gets stuck, is there a constraint optimization problem you can solve? Yes, exactly. That's exactly how we're going to do that. So it's a um, linear um, optimization problem. And you want to minimize the initial potential. Yeah, but that's what we're going to see next next time how to do that. Yes. So, if you wrote Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're going to see the rules in a in a moment. You'll see how that works. Yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah. Yeah, it looks like we will not see um, all of the rules today, but we're going to see some, but that's not a problem. We'll finish next time. Um, so yeah, the rules are also um, on the second problem set, the full set of rules, so you can can look at them already online. 
but we'll go through um, all of them. So let's start with a, a variable rule uh, because it's nice and simple. So here, um, oh yeah, I didn't tell you how the how the type rules or how the type judgment looks. So maybe that's what I what I should do first. Um, so. Uh, Type judgment has a, a signature. Um, it's resource annotated context. Um, then it has the constant input potential, constant output potential, an expression, and the uh, result type. So this is the, the type judgment. OK, and the intuition is that the um, potential um, uh, given by this context gamma and q, okay, is sufficient to pay for the cost of the evaluation of E. So meaning if you start your um, evaluation judgment, you know, with like the number given by this q plus um, the um, um, gamma in um, uh, an environment V, okay, then um, this will not get stuck. Um, for, for like uh, because it runs out of resources and afterwards the stuff you have left is given by Q prime and um, the potential given by the return value um, on a type B. Okay, this is like the intuitive meaning but we will, yeah, uh, we will see um, how that works in the soundness theorem that we will see next time. Okay, so now the variable rule. So we have, again, um, this affine type system. So we just have the variable x in the context here. And now um, we have the constant resources q available. And the thing um, will just get the same type b. E, and what we need is that the q is sufficient to pay for the cost plus the constant potential we have afterwards. Okay, like that. Um, okay, another rule we can look at is uh, let. So here we have again our context. Yeah. Probably not going to fit here. Uh, let's go over here. Okay, so signature is always the same. We have our context, gamma, that we have to split up here and we have q, q prime, let e1 equals x and e2, and the whole thing gets type b. So and this is one of my um, favorite rules because it's very uh, intuitive. So you start um, kind of like executing the e1, okay? So you feed in the potential um, given by um, the gamma one, okay? And you feed in, let me use the same notation as in the, okay, here it's called P. Um, and what is P? Well, um, P is simply Q where you um, subtract the cost of the let. So, okay, basically the Q flows um, into the evaluation of um, E1 together with the gamma one. And um, you get this A here. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, the type of the E1. And then you take the potential of the gamma two and the potential uh, that you have now from the A. You assign this to X. And then you take the p prime, 
and you get the Q prime and F E has type B. Yeah? So you, you have your potential given by gamma, you split it up, you get the gamma one, you let it flow through E1, you get the result, you combine it with the gamma two, and you pay for the E2. So that's what's happening here. And that's also like a rule where you can see why this is so compositional because I mean the, the result of the um, E1 might of course be like you know some complicated data structure and usually you know if you now want to combine um, the, the bounds you have then you have to reason about the size of this data structure but here this all happens implicitly and you don't have to worry about it at all and that's why you can automate it. Okay so um, maybe let's just do the um, cons and the match, and maybe also the nil today, and then we're done, and the rest we do next time. So um, the nil is simple um, because um, you don't have to pay for um, for the potential um, of the list at all. So you just have an empty context. Q Q prime. And you can just assign any type A um, and any potential P to the output, okay? Because the list has length zero. Uh, yes. Oh, what the sigma means? Um, it's just a function signature. Um, I think I just deleted it. Yeah. So it, yeah. You'll see it in the application, like you know, last time. That's where you look up the function types. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, the cons. So here um, you have to, of course, um, uh, talk about the potential of the list. So let's say we start um, with x type A and uh, X1 of type A and X2 is a list type with annotation P. And we have again our Q, Q prime here and then we have the cons X1, X2 as type L, P of A. Okay, and now um, we have some interaction, of course, between the Q, Q prime, and the P, okay? So here, the Q needs to be sufficient to pay for the cost of the cons, plus the resulting potential, plus the potential you assign to this first element, X here. So plus P. Okay, because the, the list gets longer, you have to be able to pay for it. You have seen that already in this example for a pen, you know, where you had the potential two, one you use to pay for the, uh, the cost here, so that like the, the uh, Q um, was two, the Q prime was zero, and you use the two to pay for the cost of the cons and for the head element of the list. And that's exactly what this rule tells you. So in, in the in the rule for the match, it's the same thing. It just looks a bit more complicated, but it isn't. So here um, we have our signature and um, our context, and we have a list X with annotation P, Q, Q prime, 
as always. And then we have the pattern match where you match x. And if it's nil, execute e1. Otherwise, we do this match and we execute e2. And the whole thing has type b. So, okay, so um, what's kind of like easy is what to do in the um, E1 case. So there we just take our potential gamma um, Q1, Q prime, and we execute E1, get type B. And of course, we have to um, pay for the cost of the match. So um, the Q is the M match L1 plus Q1. OK, so the more interesting case is what happens for the E2. So here, we have to extend our gamma with x1 which has type A, and x2, which has type L, P of A. Then we get the Q2, Q prime, E2, B. Okay, and the Q2, it's the same thing as for the cons, but just the other way around. So let me write it the same way. Have it here, so Q plus P equals Q2 plus M match L2. OK, so here, basically, I get the potential of the first element. I can add it to the constant thing that I have, and I can use it to uh, pay for the cost. So it's the same thing as for the cons, just the other way around. Yeah, so yeah, we're going to look at that again um, next time, but so you have an idea already how it looks. So yeah, more questions for now? Yeah. Uh, oh, here? So it's just um, this one? Yeah, just one and two. So you, you know, maybe want to have like different costs <laughs> for, for the, the um, different match cases. Yes. Yes, exactly, yeah. That's exactly what you need because here, I mean, what you could also write here is um, <coughs> credo or equal. That will also be fine, but um, we have a separate weakening rule. We call it relax, so you're going to see it next time. And we also have like this weakening rule for the context, of course, that you would also need here. Let's say, you know, in the E1, you know, you, you use only like parts of, of this gamma. Um, um, and in the E2, you would use other parts of the gamma, so there you also need this weakening to kind of like throw away potential in the context. Okay, good. So then that's it for, for today.